Namaste. Welcome to our 20th talk on the Bhagavad Gita. We're continuing, of course, with the subject of action. We'll be on that for quite a while because, well, that's kind of the foundation stone of our whole life. What is action, Krishna asks? What is karma, or kriya? What is inaction? You think, well, that's easy, but it isn't because you see, we can tell what is inaction pretty much or action physically outside. But the truth is the physical is just a small part of us. And therefore, we have to take the whole of ourselves into consideration in a subject even like action. So, I'll start again. What is action? What is inaction? Even the poet sages were bewildered regarding this matter. Now, it didn't mean they didn't know, but they found it confusing and difficult to untangle. They may have done a rather good job of it, but none of them really felt they did it to perfection. So they were in a dilemma, as, as we are in a dilemma, as we're beginning to think of these things. This action shall I explain to you, which having known, you shall be free from evil. Oh, that's a tremendous <laughs> sweeping promise. So uh, let's, let's get on and find out if he's telling us the truth. Truly, the nature of action, of wrong action and non-action is to be known. Obviously, the first word, action, he means right action. We have to know about right action, wrong action, and when not to act, not to do something we think is either good or bad, but just put things on hold for a while. The path of action is difficult to understand. And that's true just about everything that's worthwhile in life. We always want it simple. We always want it easy. Nothing worthwhile is ever simple and is ever easy. And especially in the matter of religion and philosophy, and spiritual life. He who perceives inaction in action and action in inaction, such a man is wise among men, steadfast in yoga, and doing all action. Well, it sounds kind of like a riddle. But what he means is, he who is aware that even when we act, there is a part of us that does not act, that is a witness, is an observer and an intelligent observer, which de can determine which way the action will go. So there are people that do a tremendous amount externally, but inwardly they're sitting at ease with their own pure and true self. So they can say, why well, don't do anything? Then there are those, then he says, he perceives action and inaction. There are people, they're just sitting there, may have their eyes closed, but inside they're just running like a hamster and it's a little hamster wheel. And inside, they're doing all kinds of actions, planning all kinds of actions, imagining all kinds of actions, doing all kinds of things in, in their mind, like they're thinking how they'd like to just maybe hit somebody. Uh, so you can appear to act when you're not acting, and you can appear to be not acting when you're quite busily active. So really it sums up is don't judge by appearances and understand 
that the ultimate value is the inside. But the outside must make it conducive for us to get in touch with the inside. And then that goes back the other way. It's a kind of cycle, a very logical cycle. So he who perceives inaction in action and action in inaction, such a man is wise among yoga. Uh, such a man is wise among men. Sorry. Steadfast in yoga and doing all action. So if you really have got to that state of wisdom, then you become a yogi. And you're not just an ordinary yoga, yogi, you are yoga yukta. You are joined, united to yoga itself. You've assimilated it to such a degree that yoga has become a part of you. So you're both, in a sense, yoga and yogi together. And that's a person who is truly wise. And the, he describes this person as him whose undertakings are devoid of plan and desire for results. Now, you can't take that literally. I mean, don't we have to intelligently plan what we're going to do? You can't get anything without making a plan, even if it was just going and look and seeing what you uh, can get and what its qualities are, how much does it cost, what does it take to get? I mean, you have to plan a lot. So why then does he say that? But he's saying, be devoid of plan and desire for results and only results. You see, there has to be something beyond the short-term immediate result. So rather than planning and saying, well, it costs so much money and I do have this much money and I can do that, do that, do that et cetera, that uh, it's not the intelligent part, it's the brooding, I've got to get it, I've got to get it, I've got to figure out how to get it, and all my interest is on that. Uh, there are a lot of households where the family, in the sense of the children, are totally neglected. The father's busy being a businessman. And after all, I work and I bring home the money, he says to his wife. You're going to have to corral those kids and you're going to have to, to manage. Manage on my budget, all right? And then, of course, she has her own complaint back at him. Well, but you're not here all day long. <laughs> you're off there in an office. Here I am. I've got to look after this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because neither of them agrees to just try to understand the other. This is the main problem between men and women in general. They don't look at each other as real, except when they want to gripe. And they don't learn from each other. This is the main thing. They don't look and say, well, yes, maybe I should modify myself. I should be a little less of that and a little more of that on both sides. This, this is a very, very important thing. So having abandoned attachment for action's truth, always content, always content, not depending on anything, even when acting. In other words, that's a very high state. You can't do it without being a yogi, and you can't do it without being totally satisfied with him. What's the last clause, which is a really great one? He truly does nothing at all. In other words, the, your action no longer creates a reaction. You don't have to in the future reap a result. There is a particular group, group that is, since they have no spiritual life, I'm talking about an Indian group. They're hardly well known, thank heaven. 
but I've known uh, members. They're obsessed with karma. I mean, I don't mean just a little bit. I mean, they are obsessed with karma. And they're very, very literal in action, reaction, and so on. And I knew this follower of theirs here in America. And uh, he completely was, again, he wasn't interested in his own personal life. He wasn't interested in his state of mind. He wasn't interested in protect, particularly doing right action. But, oh my gosh, my karma. What will create karma? What will be bad karma? They almost never acted like anything created good karma. It was all bad karma. They were scared of. So, anyway, a friend of mine was visiting with him once and knew this obsessive thing with him. And there was a noise at the door. They thought somebody was going to come knock on the door. But they could see just slightly uh, the doorknob moved. So uh, this man got up and he went and he opened the door. And what do you think he saw on his door? A clear plastic bag that had a sample bottle of bleach in it. Apparently this company decided handing out free samples was the way. But they didn't want to have a salesman give a, a pitch. What's going, how long are you going to talk about bleach to somebody that comes to the door? So suddenly, oh my God, they gave me the bleach and that means I have a karmic debt. Seriously, I have a karmic debt. And, and no, no, no. And so he grabbed it and he ran and he he was on an upper story. So he looked down the stairwell and said, sir, sir, I don't want this. I don't want this. And he held the thing out. And the man said, no, no, no. And he let go of it, dropped, broke. Everything splattered everything. All over again, that poor, that poor man who was just trying to earn some money, putting bleach bottles and bags on people's doorknobs. You see, Abhaya, we've just said this, without fear, fearless. People like that are, are racked by fear. This man had not had the misfortune to be born into a fundamentalist uh, Protestant church that would have threatened him all the time. But he supposedly had become very sophisticated and joined this Indian sect and had nothing but fear in his life. And, and he does something like this, totally irrational. You often have to ask yourself, is my wisdom wise or is it foolish? Acting with the body alone, that means not letting your, the emotions and the mind get involved because uh, without your mind, your body can't act and won't act. You can't even sleepwalk without your subconscious mind at least being doing things. Acting with the body alone, meaning separate in his consciousness, not enmeshed in it. Without wish, with, with his thought and lower self restrained because the mind runs here and there. And the lower self says, well, what about this? Why couldn't I do that? And so on. It's just like a child, just tell it to go sit in the corner and be quiet. And you'd be amazed how well that can work. You can sometimes say to your mind, shut up. And you know, for a while it will. I don't understand all that, but it works. I, at least it works for me. Abandoning all acquisitors, all I've got to have, I've got to have, Though acting, because he will act if he is wise, he incurs no fault. <clears throat> now, more of internal matters. Content with what comes unbidden. Because he understands his karma. Now, content doesn't mean he thinks it's pleasant necessarily. Content doesn't mean that he thinks it's desirable necessary, necessarily, but he knows 
if I don't reap my karma, I won't get anywhere and I'll never get out of jail. Therefore, when it happens, well, I'll realize it's happened and I'll react in a way that is consistent with the principles of right thought and action, with dharma. And just quietly take care of it without making any fuss and incurring any more tangles. Beyond the pairs of opposites, that's pleasure, pain, heat, cold, etc., and like, dislike, happy, unhappy, and so on. Beyond it, because the self is beyond it. The mind is right in the middle of it. So when we can keep moving our awareness back into the self, we'll find that we become beyond the entanglement of these things. They'll still be there in our view, but they won't be, in a sense, touching us. Beyond the pairs of opposites, free from envy. Envy isn't just saying, well, I wish he didn't have it and I had it instead. Envy is, I want to have what he's got. Well, he managed it, why can't I manage it? She got it, why can't I get it? This is a real mistake. Because we didn't come here, we talk about the rat race. Well, we didn't come here to race around like a rat gnawing at everything it wants and hauling things away to its nest to keep and say, now it's mine, nobody else is going to get it. Con content with what comes unbidden, beyond the pairs of opposites, free from envy, the same in success or failure. Well, if you fail, well, I'll just try again and succeed. In other words, you don't say, oh, God, I am a failure, or... Hmm, I'm a success. I got that, you see. The ego is so little, and it could take such small things to congratulate itself on. So, the same in success or failure, even though acting, he is not bound. Because bondage is the ordinary way. How, how? Japa tapa. Tapa means generation of heat is tapasya. And they say that in India, japa tapa. In other words, through the mantra, the invocation of the mantra, there isn't any other way, I can guarantee you. Uh, the awakening, the life, the quickening, yes, the fire is kindled. And then we can pass to a whole higher level of existence, even while we're right here in this world. Glibly, people say in the world, but not of it. Who but the adept yogi can be in the world, but not of it? The karma of one who is free from attachment, whose thought is established in knowledge. And knowledge is not just facts. There is satya, there is truth. But it's very interesting. One time somebody asked Shankaracharya about this question, because you see among yama and yama, it says satya. And they said, what about satya? And he said, there's no such thing as satya. Shaka. There's no such thing as truth. There is only sat, the true. Or there is no such thing as reality, meaning by as a separate mode of existence. There is only the real. And we have to understand that at every moment, I am in God. Everything. This is vibrating energy. And the energy and the basis of the vibrating energy, whoops, is thought. And the basis of thought is consciousness, and God is consciousness. There's that hierarchy. And we've got to trace that progression back. And then...
we will be ready to go on from there uh, in the next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Forgive my rambling. It is the nature of the mind. I'm sorry.